You're listening to Parasurge Radio with paranormal news, views and reviews from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web at Parasurge Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the KTPF Reload Show. In case you're wondering what the Reload Show is about, if you haven't heard previous shows, these are the interviews that were conducted by good friends of mine, Steve and Sue Taggart, in the days of the KTPF radio show. Their own radio show ran for just over four years, broadcasting every week for over three hours. I joined them in the last 18 months of the show's run, but eventually the guys felt they'd just about had enough. It was a monumental effort to keep broadcasting every week for three hours. It was a wonderful show. But unfortunately, they're no longer involved, and the shows have just sort of sat in the archives. I thought it would be nice to bring them back to life and bring you the interviews that the guys conducted over those four years. They include some of the most interesting people within the world of the paranormal and some not so well known but nevertheless still very interesting. We even have one or two rather unusual shows including a live seance and um, other things along those lines. Anyway, hopefully you enjoy tonight's show and this is the KTPF Reload Show. Enjoy. This program deals with themes of an adult nature and is intended for a mature audience. You're in the right place. Place. Online, on the web, and on air. All over the world. Talk Radio. You hear us, we hear you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the KTPF Community Talk Show. My name is Suzanne. And I'm Steve. And I'm Andy. Hey. Hey. (laughs) And we are here keeping the paranormal friendly. We bring you a relaxed show with no pressure. On tonight's show... Um, we have Mika Hanks, uh, who is an author, researcher, and Fortean, um, and sceptical, by no means, uh, inquirer into the UFO and anomalous activity. A radio personality, his work addresses a variety of areas, including history, politics, scientific theories, and unexplained phenomena. Mika is, uh, sorry, Micah is open-minded, but sceptical in his approach as I said. His research has examined a broad variety of subjects over the years incorporating interest in scientific anomalies, cultural studies, uh, psychology, sci-fi and pop culture including government sequences and the prospects of our technological future as a species as influenced by science. Uh, An author of many books um, and lives in the Asheville, North Carolina. Mika, uh, Mika, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Please bear with us tonight. We're having technical problems. Um, uh, basically, my live streams decided to muck about, so uh, we're actually on new stream tonight. So I'm, um, I'm a bit worried at the moment, but it won't affect our um, uh, recording at all. So for YouTube problems, so uh, um, as I say, beware, <laughs> be wary. I'm a little bit on. Uh, on tender hooks. <laughs> That's okay. Hey, nothing a sonic screwdriver won't fix, right? Definitely. How are you anyway, Micah? Well, I'm doing wonderfully. I'm so glad I was able to join you. You know, uh, tech issues or not, I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> That's great. So, well, you've got myself, uh, Suzanne, and my husband, Steve. Hi, Micah. Uh-huh. Hey, Steve, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. Doing good. And also, we have Andy, our parapsychologist. Hello, uh, Mike. How's things? Good. Things are good, Andy. Good to have you on here with us. Okay, so um, Micah, first of all, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, goodness, well, apart from being a mouthy individual, uh, <laughs> be, being Micah Hanks is, uh, you know, interesting, and I enjoy that uh, because of the uh, the obvious adventure that is involved with being an interesting person, either by choice or by design. Um, now, I guess for, for me, I'm somebody who's fascinated with. Uh, you know, the small things in life, you know, and the little wonder that you can derive from every kind of experience you can have in the everyday. But from an early age, 
I've had a particular fascination with uh, the the unexplained, you know, mm. uh, ghosts and things like this, you know, UFOs, uh, cryptozoological creatures, and the kinds of things that, you know, generally, and, and many would argue rightly so, uh, cannot be uh, attributed to being a part of the greater scientific catalog of, of knowledge that we have attained as humans. And I think that really the fundamental thing that we got to all remember is that all all knowledge is something that we have to strive to attain, and I think that all phenomena begin as unexplained phenomena. And maybe there's some out there that we have yet to explain, and I think that we uh, we have to remind ourselves that from time to time. So, so that in a nutshell is me, and that's what I'm interested in. Right, okay. So what what started you into this um, into this subject? Um, you, you cover quite a lot on your show, obviously, and in your books, but um, what what started you on this road? What 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 was the trigger? Some people say Doctor Who's, and you know hmm. that sort of thing. What, what what was it for you? For me, you know, uh, although I'm a, definitely a fan of the Doctor, that didn't come until much later, uh, and, and at the insistence of of you know followers of followers of my work who kept saying. You know who you remind me of? <laughs> I didn't know anything about Doctor Who, and uh, I finally took people's lead and uh, wanted to see who this man was who was impersonating me. <laughs> I kid, but, but, the, uh, but when it comes to the actual interest in a lot of this phenomena, I think that that's maybe the, the reason for that comparison, in truth, because uh, uh, you know when I was a kid, I remember I came home one night from my grandparents' house and looked up into the sky, and I had seen uh, a little light, which probably was nothing more than uh, you know a star or maybe an airplane of some kind. But in in my mind, the way I interpreted it, it looked like a rocket yeah. or, or something. It, it, had, it had a vaguely kind of a rocket-like shape. And I asked my parents about that. I said, "What's that?" And they said, "Oh, it's probably just an airplane." Yeah. But I was I was just fascinated. And I hear a lot of people uh, nowadays with the, that I'll talk with, uh, you know, who who remember having these vivid memories of childhood that may or may not have actually been what their childlike mind was perceiving at that time. And that's a, a fundamental point, I think, to, to keep in mind about a lot of things, the way that our minds phrase things in our environment and the way that our attitudes toward them change as we get older. Because I've often said that I'm a skeptical person, and I really am, and I think that you have to be, but that doesn't mean that I doubt that all of these phenomena exist. I just don't know that it's always what we think it is. For example, let me give you a brief example. When I was probably in my early 20s, I, I really started getting serious into what we call the examination of parapsychology and claims of ghosts. And yeah. um, I really do think that there's something to it because of the historical catalog of data that we have. I mean, for about as long as there has been consciousness among humans and for about as long as we have been keeping record of our activities on this planet, history as we would call it, we have had these reports of encounters with what we call spirits, apparitions, ghosts, specters, sometimes angels and demons, I mean, all different kinds of things. And I, I don't doubt that there is some sort of a phenomena that people are experiencing. But I wonder sometimes, you know, do we have a lot of preconceptions about, like, for instance, what a ghost is? Mm -hmm. A simple question that a lot of people would say, why would you even ask this? A simple question would be, what is a ghost? Is a ghost really the spirit of a dead person, or is that merely what we generally attribute a ghost to being? Same you could ask about a UFO. Is a UFO an interplanetary spaceship like so many many people would presume or could a ufo be any number of things and sometimes simpler phenomena but nonetheless an unexplained form of phenomena that we have yet to fully understand and so for me what it's been is coming from an early age uh, you know with with interest in all of this and and you know reaching adulthood and going on into you know being a full-fledged uh, researcher and writer who studies this sort of a thing but who tries to strip it down to the basic questions and ask if we don't have cultural uh, biases that we apply toward unexplained phenomena that cause us to go in one direction in relation to how we study it, when in fact it very well may be putting us right off the, uh, the proverbial path, so to speak. Right, okay. So before we go into UFO singularity and, and other topics um, around that, um, can you tell us a bit about how why you started the Graylian Report? Where did that all come from? Yeah, the, uh, the Graylian Report... Uh, is a website that I moderate. And of course, it's actually best known today as, a, as an audio podcast that I put out. We do stream live Monday nights on the uh, KGRA radio network. And you can find that from my website. But the, uh, the, the, the site itself actually dates back to a much earlier time. Uh, it was about eight years ago, and I just wanted to essentially put together a news site that would kind of take a hard look at some of these kinds of things, although at times it has been extremely tongue-in-cheek. There's been a lot of humor that I've uh, inflected into 
the Graylian Report. Uh, at other times, there's been a lot of seriousness. And I think that the current incarnation of the Graylian Report is a lot more serious and a lot more journalistic than it used to be. It began really as a blog where I was just you know, sounding off about paranormally themed subjects, sometimes skeptically, sometimes uh, in defense of uh, the apparent presence of a phenomena. Uh, because I do feel that often what we call the skeptical movement today is something that is often dismiss, uh, dismissing things out of hand, uh, based more, I think, on the expectation of disbelief rather than the actual lack of evidence. Although in many cases there are phenomena that people believe in that I do think that there's a lack of evidence for. Um, you know, a simple example, for instance, would be what we call rods, these supposed sky fishes that sometimes yeah. are photographs and things like that. It seems very obvious to me that it's it's based on the wing beat of a moth or other kinds of insects really in relation to the uh, the aperture of the camera or the kind of, of the, the rate of uh, film if it's video. Sometimes these things appear on video as well, and depending on the different frame rate, there can be little anomalies that can be interpreted as looking like one thing on camera, which if you or I saw it with our naked eye, we would be easily capable of discerning that's a moth. And so, you know, sometimes it's that obfuscation between various media, film, you know, or video or something like that, uh, or even maybe the absence of light. We're in the dark, we hear strange noises, we think something strange is happening. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be the case, but in the absence of light, it makes it a little difficult to to determine. So so with the Graylian Report, I kind of came into it in that attempt. And it, on the podcast from time to time, I'll even say that when we come back, your light in the darkness it's important to light that, that candle in the dark, which uh, Carl Sagan talked about. But I think also not to dismiss out of hand the possibility that there are genuine phenomena, yeah, as we'll be yeah. discussing in relation to UFOs here in a moment, that may exist. Right, okay. Now you consider yourself, you said, as a skeptic. How do people approach you because of this? That's a good question, Suzanne. Uh, not often in a very... Uh, angry way. It, it mm. happens from time to time, but uh, you know you got to keep in mind. Uh, you know, for instance, when you're thrust into the midst of what may be a a group of people who are more prone toward belief or advocacy in you know the presence of things like UFOs, and your build as a skeptic. This happened, for instance, back in 2013 when I was uh, booked as a lecturer at the International UFO Congress mm. in Fountain Hills, Arizona. I was the only skeptic, the one, the only person billed as a skeptic that was on the entire uh, roster of speakers that year. And uh, at the end of the event, Richard Dolan, a good friend of mine, uh, along with Stanton Friedman and I, uh, we participated in a three-person panel that uh, our friend Lee Spiegel of Huffington Post moderated. And, of course, he was playing up the fact that I call myself a skeptic. And people kept coming up to me and they were saying, you know, Micah, <laughs> I'm not getting much skepticism off of you. I've heard that often. And I say this because... And I would, in, in fact, in response to people who say I don't get much skepticism off of you, I don't think that the skepticism, which I think is fundamental Pyrrhonist skepticism, you know, questioning everything and abstaining from just leaping to a conclusion because it seems to be the case, I maintain that real true skepticism is never dismissive or cynical toward evidence. It merely asks questions about how best can we approach this in order to find the truth. That's what I think we're trying to find. And with the modern skeptical movement, we see, for instance, the famous James Randi, uh, who has time and time again claimed to have been able to you know, completely debunk various phenomena. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake has been uh, an object of his attacks over the years, and yet recent indications, uh, including actually uh, the UK media, I believe it had been the Daily Mail that had featured a, a very, uh, very elaborate article on this, uh, Randy was not able to back up a lot of the claims of debunking that he had been espousing for years in relation to Sheldrake's work. And in fact, it seems more and more that there was, there were outright lies told about the quote unquote evidence to support the falsehood of Dr. Sheldrake's work. And so we see that there are not all, but some members in the, in the skeptical community who are less than ethical about what they claim is the truth. And frankly, I think it is more that cult of belief that they are appending to skepticism than true honest skepticism. Now, there have been times where I've had to say to somebody before, look, what you're presenting to me does not seem to be subst uh, substantive. It does not appear to be something that is supported by facts. Yeah. But, but that is a different thing than to just dismiss out of hand and, and to lie, even worse, to make the claim yes. that something doesn't exist. And that's what we've seen certain members of the skeptical movement doing. So I'm not that skeptic. And uh -huh. that's what I tell people uh, generally in terms of perception. Right. And what do you think to James well, yeah, Randi uh, dropping down at the moment? <laughs> oh, 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 you mean uh, you, the, the, the he's audio step, level? He's stepping down, isn't he, apparently? And um, 
he's he's backing off now or something, retiring or something. Yes, he's certainly going to retire, but also we actually talked about the Sheldrake stuff last week, so if you remember. Yeah, yeah, we did. He has been attacking Rupert Sheldrake for a number of years and had to re-back off because one of the main claims he made against Sheldrake was clearly false. And Mm. he's now very, well, semi-publicly apologised for his statements against Rupert Sheldrake, but not as publicly as he criticised him, which I think is rather interesting. But sorry, I just wanted to get that bit in there. So, (laughs) Harry. Yeah, so I I believe he's he's stepping down now. He's he's decided to retire. He's he's stepping down from the educational thing he does. Yeah. He's still going to try and out people. Do you think he'll still try and out people, Micah? He said he was. Uh, And we're talking about James Randi, correct? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if, uh, I, I think he'll always be a, a vocal opponent of, you know, claims of the paranormal, but, uh, but, you know, he's also up in his years and he's spent a lifetime, you know, <laughs> aggressively attacking claims of the paranormal. But, but again, you know, I, I'm sure that he'll remain probably that kind of a, one of the figureheads in the movement, and I'm sure that, yeah, we'll, I, we, we probably haven't heard the last of him, I'll say that. Right, okay. <laughs> now, just before we go any further, um, we've got somebody in the chat room now where she actually asked us to get you on the show, and her name's Beth Arzi. Oh, Beth. Beth yeah. is absolutely a dear. One of my dearest uh, listeners out there, and of course, somebody I, I consider a friend as well. Yeah, <laughs> but so she knows that. She knows that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I just wanted you to say hello to her. <laughs> oh, she's so sweet. Hey, Beth, how you doing? Of course, I... I love hearing from Beth, and 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 you know I have to just say this really quickly. I hope you don't mind, but you know Beth is is a wonderful musician, and uh, as much as she might like hearing my voice from time to time on podcasts and shows, I equally enjoy hearing Beth Arzi because she's one of the finest singers, and I keep saying that uh, one day I'm going to uh, employ her vocal talents on a recording I do. So let it be on the record right here and now, folks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about music, you're into bluegrass, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I am. And jazz. And- Oh, yeah. I mean, everything. My dad was, a, as a matter of fact, still is, although he doesn't do it that much anymore. My father is still a, a great jazz guitarist and, uh, and a mm-hmm. collector of jazz music. And uh, But he also plays bluegrass banjo. <laughs> he's one of the most accomplished musicians I've ever known. Right, um, right. A lot like Beth, in fact. And, uh, you know, he's a... Uh, you know he's been a, a great uh, influence on me, but yes, I, part of what I do, uh, you know, in my in my, I guess you could call it spare time. Although really, I guess technically, I, I do more of it for my living uh, than than just for uh, for enjoyment. Uh, is performing as a musician, and so that's a that's a big part of who Micah Hanks is. <laughs> <laughs> right now, how do you um, how does the internet impact on your research? I find that it helps a lot, and there's more good than bad, in my opinion. A lot of people think, oh, the Internet, you know, it's back in the old days, we had to go to libraries and we had to look for information. Uh, and, and I find that uh, there is so much information that has been stored in, in books, in analog, we might say. <laughs> and, and people, the problem with the Internet is that researchers, especially into this kind of phenomena, but it's not exclusive to the unexplained. I mean, because I'm just, I've got one foot in the unexplained. I mean, I, I also do a podcast called Middle Theory that's news and events. And so I'm, I follow history, current events, politics, global affairs, economics. I, I, you know, the unexplained is merely one of many things that I have a serious interest in, including music. And with any subject that you're researching, what you will find is that there are people who will use the Internet. And unfortunately, I think that they will they will tend to reach for the lowest hanging fruit in terms of information and evidence. I do maintain people need to go out and get in books and, and, and go to libraries, get into books and, and find information. The Internet, however... And, and the people who are the decriers of the Internet age and what it's done to libraries and books and, and proper research, as it were, uh, they often fail to mention the fact that thanks to the World Wide Web, we can find out about books that otherwise we might not have known, mm-hmm. even with the world's most elaborate card catalog. We would not have been able to find those books. And uh, with the web, for instance, I've done a lot of research uh, into what I, I guess, would call classically sea serpents. Yeah, yeah. And... um there has been ever since maybe the 1950s or 60s uh, the attitude that some of these sea serpent reports might be accounted for by large eels. This is not a new idea by any means. But what's interesting is I've found that uh, in the 1960s, you know, and, and, and throughout the, the, the subsequent decades, when biologists, the likes of Roy P. Mackle and others, were were going back and forth over the different possibilities as it relates to reports of what appear to be, I mean, literally dinosaur-like creatures for lack of a better term, that have appeared from time to time in, in various literature. Uh, 
there have been a lot of different suppositions. Could they be plesiosaurs? Could they be some sort of a, an unknown species? Could they be a known species but a larger variety of them? Since we know we've got large squid, we've got, I mean, all the, the largest animals basically in the world, including the very largest known, the blue whale, exist in our oceans. It seems very logical that if we're going to find another large animal, the oceans will be where to look. And marine biologists speculate as recently as the last few years that there may be as many as 70 new large species of animals in the oceans that we have yet to discover. So mm -hmm. put that in your pipe and smoke it. Oh, yeah. And exactly. it, as we think about the idea about sea serpents uh, and the idea of the, the eel and how the eel may work into all of this, uh, I had begun to dig up obscure reports of the discovery of what are called uh, leptocephalus, which are, which are essentially eel larvae. Now, an eel larva typically is about 1 32nd the length of the adult eel before it begins to mature, and they go through different stages of elvers, and then they become, I think, uh, I think what's called a, a yellow eel, and then they, of course, get a little older. They turn silver in color, their eyes begin to bulbs, and they reach sexual maturity. And both the European and also American varieties of eel, they'll, they'll breed in the Sargasso Sea, but then they'll head upstream and they'll actually go up into freshwater territories. And then once they reach maturity, they come back down and they breed again in the ocean. And it's a very strange life cycle. When we have these, the oceanic eels, you know, again, we don't expect to find giant eels. And yet there have been reports of leptocephalus, the larva of eels, that have been as anywhere from long uh, as two to maybe six feet in length. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to find information about a lot of this through rather obscure science journals that I, I hadn't had access to the World Wide Web I wouldn't know about. And I want to just point out really quickly, we now know thanks to the accumulation of knowledge about these kinds of subjects that the six-foot-long, quote-unquote, apparent larva of an eel actually was what is known as, I believe, a notochanthroform. In other words, a snub-nosed, spiny eel, which is not really an eel. It's a little more like a fish, a close relative, kind of in between. And, uh, and this was not exactly an eel larva as we would uh, expect it to be or would have had to have thought it would be back in 1936, I believe, when Anton Brun pulled one up, uh, one up in a, fish, a fishing net off the coast of Africa. So mm. the, the point is, is that there's a lot of obscure data out there. And as researchers into this kind of stuff, sometimes we have to dig into the minutia of technical data in order to understand what we may or may not be dealing with. And while I haven't found good proof that these leptocephalus are eel larvae of an extraordinarily large variety, I've found a lot of good data to help me understand what it may or may not be. And the web has certainly helped with that. You seem to be interested in the lesser studied facts, don't you? Yeah, I mean, how many, you know, we hear about cryptozoology. Yeah. People yeah. want to go, they want to look at Bigfoot reports. People want to go and they want to look at reports of, you know, you know, flying monsters or sea monsters. And, you know, again, it's sometimes the smallest things, the eel larva that's a few inches long that may hold the key to understanding all this, you know. So, yeah, you have to look at the minutia. And that's that's why I say that, you know, really, I, I maintain a fascination with the tiny things, because usually it's the last little thing where we look to look, we think to look that you, that we'll find maybe the best evidence for, <laughs> for something. Now, in your book, The UFO Singularity, can you tell us a bit of what it's all about? Absolutely. The, uh, the, the, the broader concept I'd hoped to write about, uh, because I never considered myself a commentator on UFOs, until maybe a few years ago, and I was approached by the staff of uh, the magazine here in the United States that was known as UFO Magazine. And uh, there had been one in Britain as well. And uh, I began writing a column online and then a column in print for a short period for that magazine. And at present, I'm not sure about the status of the magazine. Uh, it had a brief comeback, and now I'm, I, I don't know that it's going to remain in print. But I remain friends with the folks who had uh, been the, uh, the producers of that magazine. They had invited me to come and start writing for the magazine. And I thought that's novel because if anything i think i've been best known for investigation into things along the lines of cryptozoological matters earth lights i've had a long fascination with the brown mountain lights here in western north carolina which are similar to the Hestelin lights in norway for those who are familiar with that earth light phenomena um my publishers at new page books uh in, in new york had uh had approached me about doing a book, a comprehensive book on UFOs. And so I wanted to do a book called The UFO Reality that looked at the minutia. Yet again, you know, the, the best evidence that I felt could be made for there being an apparent anomalous phenomena that is observed in our skies. And one area that I wanted to focus on was the way that our present day technology, and maybe more importantly, the technology of the future, would, would influence our study of this phenomena that we call UFOs. Many people yet again dismiss out of hand UFO because they take it to mean a spaceship from outer space or you know, something piloted by extraterrestrial entities. And I do want to point out that 
going back even prior to Project Blue Book, which the files for which were <laughs> it was reported had been released online. Finally, that's actually not the case. They've been online for years and they've been publicly available for longer than there's been the internet. But uh, a, a, a diligent researcher by the name of John Greenwald had managed to get PDF versions of them on his website, the Black Vault, which now have been taken down because of all things a copyright infringement suit. That's yeah. Second, and yes, I reported on that a few weeks ago, and then said, "Well, I can't find them." Literally on the show we were talking about, it, and they had vanished. So, yeah, thank you, Nick. That feels like it feels that detail in for Isn't that strange, though? Yeah, and just to be brief about that, is yeah, Ancestry.com of all websites had been. They had a subsidiary website called Fold3 that claimed the digital copyright on those files. So, yeah, and and that was apparently what the uh, the case was. So so anyway, John Greenwald's had to take those down. But I bring that up because even before Project Blue Book, we had Project Sign, who had given this <laughs> – this was an Air Force project that was essentially determining it to the best of their ability based on the facts what this apparent UFO phenomena was. And one of their determinations in their so-called estimate of the situation had been that this might be, or some of them might be, extraterrestrial phenomena. We don't know. But there was a possibility, and maybe even a likelihood at that time in the 1950s, that they felt that could be what we were dealing with. Now, with the UFO singularity, you know, I don't dismiss that, that possibility, but I have often wondered if there were not other technologies that we, and that there are not maybe still technologies in our midst here on Earth, maybe of earthly design, that we don't know about. And so the central crux of the book is really looking at the idea that there might be technologies from here on Earth, and and also at very least the possibility that we may be at times in, uh, incorporating into what we call the UFO uh, presence uh, various earthly technologies that may be capable of extremely advanced uh, physics, maybe even on par with what we would like in the time travel. Uh, now, there was a skeptical commentator who I actually have a lot of respect for, and I should actually, if I'm going to mention his name, I should say in equal measure that I also respect him a lot as a person, Jason Colavito. Uh, we often disagree, but I still respect even those who are opponents. And Jason had said, Micah Hanks' book is about aliens from the future and other made-up ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's not exactly what the book's about. But by the same token, I do maintain that, yeah, there is a lot of speculation about this, and I think that we have to look at the data we've collected about UFOs and from time to time try to draw although carefully, and, and, and only when it can be backed up with good fact, uh, factual information, we have like to try and draw connections about what we may be dealing with so that we can better determine what the phenomena is. And this is where things get little, a little difficult for people. In, in their simplest essence, I'll say this, that what my personal survey of UFO phenomena has, has brought me is that while there are a lot, and I mean a lot, of anomalous reports, and people say, oh, you're young, you haven't read all the old stuff, I think I own almost every book that's <laughs> – almost <laughs> – Almost every book that's ever been published about UFOs. Okay. Got, Mike, I've got a question for you. Well, sure, go ahead. That's okay. good. Uh, I'm talking about the UFOs. I think part of the problem with our understanding of uh, USOs, UFOs is uh, us not understanding the technology. Do you think that's a big part of it? Well, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, to, to answer your question, the, the, the very quick final point that I was going to make just a moment ago was that you know, my own survey has not indicated clearly that we're dealing with something extraterrestrial. So whether we're dealing with something that people perceive as ETs or we're dealing with something that is apparently our own, whatever this technology is, when we're – remember Clark's third law, which uh, was essentially the idea that any significantly more advanced technology as observed by a lesser advanced civilization – will perceive that technology as magic. Whatever we're perceiving right now, it's hard for us to account for because it seems so far beyond what we know to exist that it seems literally the stuff of magic. That could be our very own technology, but that doesn't help those who are unaware of that technology, like you said, Steve, to reconcile with it any better. And so that's the fundamental problem we have to try and face and, and, and reconcile with with UFOs. We have to try and get to a point where we say, okay, we may not know what it is, but we can at least account for a phenomenon. But maybe the question for many is, can we account for there being a phenomenon? Mm, definitely. Andy? What? Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. You threw me there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Got you. <laughs> Touchdown! <No. laughs> I was getting a message from a previous guest who I'm saying should be listening into this. I think it finds you very interesting. You have to say, I'm certainly finding myself agreeing with a lot of what saying that we do dump very much to conclusions too quickly on the nature and the origins of phenomena that we might be examining or, or detecting. So, um, yes, I like very much what you're saying at the moment, certainly. So, carry on. <laughs> well, thank you, Andy. Yeah, but you know, again, that's the thing is that to me, 
in the tradition of, of skepticism going all the way back to ancient Greece. We don't have to put on togas or anything, but we can at least adopt the idea. Mm. It's important to, to, to ask questions. And, yeah. and I know that a lot of modern skeptics would be cringing when they hear that. And I know that they really disagree with me on this point. They say, Maki, you're really a believer in, in sheep's clothing. <laughs> you know, you're, you're somebody who really believes, and you're just saying that we should just ask questions, and that's fundamentally dangerous. Well, let me tell you, it is dangerous, I think, guys, when we're talking about, well, let's just ask questions about, uh, you know, I mean, any number of controversial issues that fall under the guise of what people call pseudoscience, whether it ranges from faith healing to the anti-vaccination crowd. There's been a big, big to do here in the States about a measles outbreak that many in the science community say could have been avoided if vaccinations had been properly applied. Uh, mm -hmm. And sure, I think that there are some people out there who say it is my right to choose whether I think that a vaccination is something that is safe to be administered to my child. The other end of the argument, which is interesting, and I'm not trying to take a side on the argument, but more importantly, just to point out that there is this argument there are those who say it's my right to choose, and then there, there are others who are saying, yes, but if your child has not been vaccinated and contracts measles and spreads that, you know, when 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 a choice that you have made is is putting others at risk, that's when it becomes a problem. And so it's a very difficult issue. But how that relates to skepticism is the fact that we have to take into consideration that from time to time there are things that may be damaging for people. And when science can say, okay, this is a pseudoscientific claim that may cause someone to become ill. A wonder drug that will cure cancer doesn't really cure cancer at all, but somebody in good faith pays money for it, takes it, and they die. That's a problem. And so I understand the necessity for skepticism in relation to the dangers that are present in our, in our lives, but I don't see anything dangerous per se, <laughs> at least outwardly, about saying, okay, look, there may be evidence that constitutes some credible basis for the existence of a creature that we recognize as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, not it's, 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 it's quite weird. That, I mean, we have a, a lot of reports of uh, some cryptozoology, i.e. Sasquatch and Chivacabra, and they, they all seem to be around or in the area of uh, UFO sightings. So is there a link, you wonder? I can tell you this. Uh, there was, um, <laughs> whether or not it's causative, there was a, a, a study that was carried out um, for the Freakonomics blog uh, at the New York Times website. And, uh, and the, the, the blog had actually, just for fun, uh, decided to document uh, UFO hotspots in relation to Bigfoot sighting reports. And they did find what appeared to be, statistically, a significant correlation between the locations of the sightings of the two separate phenomena. Uh, now, again, when, the reason I say it may not be causative is because a correlation, as we know, can exist without there necessarily having to be causation. There doesn't have to be a this appears and therefore it is causing this mm. for correlations to be drawn. So we have to be very careful about that. But I can at very least speak to the uh, – if you, if you ask if there's a connection, we would first have to be able to prove that UFOs and Bigfoot exist. I think that there is some compelling data for both. I wouldn't be here talking with you if I didn't think that. But – but the fundamental question about uh, this has to be answered first, you know, in relation to whether they both are real valid phenomena. If they were, it would be certainly interesting in light of the fact that we have this apparent correlation. You know, and I should find that article and send it to you. It's pretty interesting. But there have been researchers over the years who have made that comparison, uh, uh, you know, apart from actual, uh, actual statistical analyses, including Stan Gordon. A gentleman who I believe is Pennsylvania-based, and he's been a he's been a hardcore researcher for years, who has claimed that there have been numerous sightings of Bigfoot and mystery hominids or upright walking creatures that resemble humans but a little more hairy and primitive, uh, in conjunction with UFO sightings. Yeah, there's uh, that's something that's, that's always always kind of bothers me with the uh, UFO when people are saying, well, they're seeing aliens and they're this color and that color. Why are they why are they always humanoid? Why are they always two legs, two arms, and Okay, the head's a bit bigger and the eyes are bigger, but why do they always look like basically us? That's a good question too. You know, I would I would argue this. Uh, even our best scientists, you know, you know, and, and uh, you know, our physicists, our exobiologists, and those who are who are you know supposed to be the greatest thinkers. Not that I doubt that they are. I mean, I really think that many of them are. But people who are who are recognized as the greatest thinkers in relation to those kinds of questions you just asked, they have said. 
on a distant planet, it's almost certain that life will evolve and will take vastly different forms from what we know life to be. But I would say that may not be the case. And the reason why is because I wouldn't doubt that there are other forms of life very different from us. And that humanoid may be may not be rather the inter uh, you know interdimensional or interplanetary standard, but um, but I think that life like we know it, uh, physical life that has rudiments of what we appear to recognize as consciousness, may be dependent on certain evolutionary universal constraints that are conducive to the formation of humanoid entities and beings. In other words, like a hand could fit into a glove consciousness may be best suited for a humanoid shape but then again by the same token you wouldn't try and put a foot into a hand glove would you you know and that doesn't in, in other words if we're going to use the, the analogy of the glove i.e. that the body is the vessel for consciousness and the soul as we might uh, you know liken it uh, mm -hmm. according to our cultural belief systems around the world since time immemorial uh, you know there could be any number of different forms of intelligence apart from what we recognize as conscious intelligent life and so so I think that that might at very least explain why so much of what we perceive as being uh, strange phenomena is, is is so often humanoid. But I don't think that by any means that humanoid is necessarily the, the universal standard. But the problem is, is that we don't know. And yeah. we haven't gotten to a point where we've really obtained and cataloged a lot of data that can conclusively say, well, we know that this many you know alien civilizations exist. And yet what's so funny, guys, is that I see that – you know, there are a lot of people who are advocates of the exopolitical angle on all this, and they'll tell you that. They'll say that there are, you know, five different, you know, civilizations that have been visiting Earth since 1954 or whatever. You know, if there were good evidence for that, you know, <laughs> shouldn't we know about it? And I know people would say, no, it's been kept from us, or yes, certain factions of people do know about this. So I will allow for the possibility, maybe there is a cover-up. Maybe there are things that we really don't know, but I feel like there should be more obvious evidence of extraterrestrial life out there if we were indeed being visited by these said civilizations. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah, just my take. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, when it comes to the, the humanoid looking thing, I was uh, kind of wondering if if we're being made to see them that way because that's what we understand. Yes, well, or could could it even be that there's you know some facet of the way that our minds interpret phenomena that various other kinds of phenomena could be influencing the human mind, which then we interpret as being a communion, to borrow Whitley Strieber's term, with some sort of a humanoid entity, which I think really is the same thing you were saying in, in a slightly different roundabout way. But, but yeah, I wonder about that. You know, it really, we it, I think before we can understand any of this, we really have to fundamentally understand consciousness. Through understanding consciousness, we may be better equipped to understand the modalities of communication and whether or not they would be physical in nature. Alien contact may not be aliens visiting Earth or us finding an alien civilization somewhere out there. It may happen in a number of ways, and that may not be entirely physical. Yeah, I, I mean, we could, we could also look at it as the, uh, from the conspiracy theory and say that it, it's actually our own people that are dressed this way to make people think that. <laughs> yeah, Strieber uh, in Communion had uh, written uh, what I think was a rather brilliant passage, and in it he... I think uh, almost in a, in a, in a, in a slightly tongue-in-cheek, and I hope you wouldn't disagree with my interpretation of it as being that, but he said in terms of what he perceived as being an ongoing alien abduction, he had wondered at the outset, you know, could these be time travelers from our future who were donning costumes to prevent some sort of a temporal paradox? You know, whether or not that's really the case. You know, I think that we have to, you know, take a step back from the literal interpretation of a lot of what we read, and I, I think that that's the whole point. People have have taken, for instance, Strieber's writing as being the best evidence of alien visitation. And he would often point out early on, and maybe still today, I'm sure he still does today, I haven't mm -hmm. spoken with him a little bit about this on one occasion, uh, that he is very, very hesitant to leap onto the we are being visited by aliens bandwagon. There are any number of varieties of different experiences that what we have perceived as being alien contact, what that might represent. Uh, you know, everything from on the extremely skeptical end of uh, being remembrances of birth experiences um, to maybe on the uh, on the visionary sc uh, scope of things, you know, some sort of a interdimensional contact, you know, that occurs in a more uh, induced kind of a state, maybe a, hallucina a hallucinative kind of a state rather than being an actually overt physical kind of a scenario. And then there's, of course, the idea that, you know, we may have been visited by aliens just as well. I don't think we can rule that out, but you know, I'm, I'm amazed at how little evidence we have for that. 
for it to be as broad a phenomena as so many people interpret it as being, which I don't think necessarily says there's not a phenomena. I just think that whatever it is that we're experiencing and accounting for here, it's probably not what we think it is, because if it were, we should be doing a better job at defining it as such. All right, Andy? Yes, a couple of little points, actually. Um, I remember watching a TV program some years ago that was talking about the dinosaurs and what would have happened had they survived as opposed to being wiped out. And the evolutionary process would have taken them to a form that is not dissimilar to us in terms of two arms and two legs, two eyes at the front. So the suggestion I would like to make is that it's quite possible that life just genuinely evolved as it's um, carbon-based into this form because it's the most useful and convenient. But by the same token, we um, there are all sorts of odd, strange phenomena that we do experience and report that could be alien, but we wouldn't recognise them as a living entity in the same way we are. I mean, like lights, it could be just purely intelligence or purely consciousness or, or gaseous forms, except that they may be coming here um, from wherever, and we wouldn't even recognise them as being as such. So it's just really wanted to make that little point. Oh, absolutely, good points right there, Andy, and. Uh, you know, first of all, let's talk about dinosaurs for a minute because dinosaurs fascinate me. They have, you know, for as, as long as I've been able to read. We, we, we see uh, a, a variety of different interesting forms that uh, in the ancient world large reptilians took, including long neck. Granted, we've got animals just like that on planet Earth today, the giraffe, but of course not nearly quite the size uh, as, you know, maybe a, a Brachiosaurus, a Diplodocus, or more recently, as we have seen, the Dreadnoughtus, this incredibly large animal. I mean, a massive creature, roughly the same length of a 747, something so large that had it fallen over, paleontologists are not certain it would have been able to stand back up. Uh, mm -hmm. Generally, we don't see land-dwelling animals that, uh, and, and actually an animal like that, in, in, in likelihood, might have done better as being semi-aquatic, not necessarily you know, flippers and, and swimming, but I mean, something that supports its massive weight, perhaps in part by existing partially in water. That may be uh, the, the big link here with a lot of these uh, larger animals. But we also did see during the, 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 many, <laughs> the, the many years that the dinosaurs actually spent here on planet Earth, long before we arrived here, uh, we also saw bipedal forms. We did. We, we of course, had the Tyrannosaurus rex, which I think is like 99.99% genetically similar to a chicken that would run around in your backyard on a farm. Yes. Uh, the Tyrannosaurus rex, of course, this this great predator of the ancient world, was indeed, you know, a much more bird-like, really, uh, in relative terms, but a bipedal creature. Mm. We had the Velociraptors, whose intelligence was purportedly on par with a chimpanzee uh, or a young child. And uh, we, we had a variety of different forms. We had a variety of of uh, different levels of intelligence. And uh, and really the ancient world, to think that that was the, the standard of life on this planet at any time in, in, in our in, in the history of our of our world, that in itself is truly fascinating. But, yeah, I think that maybe if if indeed animals like dinosaurs had not been wiped off the face of the earth by cataclysms, uh, would we have seen them evolve into forms very similar to what we already recognize here on Earth? Had they been given the time, might they have reached that point as well? Who knows? It's a good yeah. a good question. Which brings to mind the idea that, as some have suggested, that there could still have been dinosaurs or dinosaur-like animals that have survived into the present day. One famous example, Mokele and Bimbe, a creature believed to inhabit the Lake Tele area uh, in the Congo River Valley Basin. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, a friend of mine, um, uh, Richard Freeman from uh, Leeds Cryptozoologist, he's um, forever going to look for the Makelamembe, isn't he? And uh, mm. <laughs> amongst uh, others, the Iran yeah, Pendek. The, the Iran Pendek <laughs> is his main one at the moment. Yeah, but um, but going back to your book, um, uh, Mika, sorry, Mika. Um, <laughs> oh, either's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, is uh, you talk about transhumanism, um, the singularity that speculates a near future transformation of humans into super intelligent, um, highly evolved bio machines, bio artificial intelligence. Can you tell, you tell us a bit more about that? Where you come into that? Yeah, that's that's a good question too, uh, because a lot of people think, you know, what what has this got to do with with UFOs? Well, I mean, the obvious question I think is that as many proponents of what we call technological singularity, essentially when when machines wake up, when we create, and not just it's, it's it's not just I think machines waking up, but I think also machines, not, you know, becoming intelligent and integrating to a level 
in our society and in our reality that it blurs the lines between what we perceive as being man and machine. It blurs the lines between what we perceive as being imaginary and the consensus reality. Mm. All of these kinds of things can and in likelihood, no matter how long it takes to get there, can and in likelihood will be changed by the advent of artificial intelligence. So naturally, I began looking at alien technologies, or at least the belief that there may be alien life elsewhere in the universe. Yeah. Naturally, I began looking at this under the under the uh, you know auspices of there being the possibility that there may be alien life elsewhere out there who have gone through what Ray Kurzweil and others, and some of the folks who I interviewed for my book, including Alexei Churchin, a, a Russian transhumanist, and as well as uh, Ben Gertzel, who is probably one of the leading AI researchers in the world. They're both mentioned in the book and, and interviewed. Uh, specifically, I've talked with Ben Gertzel twice now um, and others since the book was written. Artificial intelligence just is concomitant, I think, with understanding the ways that alien life may reach us and more, maybe more importantly, the next steps that humans will take in, in the evolutionary steps towards becoming extraplanetary ourselves. Mm, yeah. I'm surprised that more people don't look at that. And with the idea of transhumanism, which transhumanism, apart from the idea of artificial intelligence and all this, transhumanism has to do with the literal idea of, of our own ability to, to modify technologically ourselves and change what fundamentally humans are and have been, and the humans of tomorrow, what they will be. That is a huge question. It has been asked at times, you know, whether the UFO phenomena might be time travelers from the future coming back to keep tabs on what's going on. And, you know, just as, as crazy as any of these other ideas, that, that one probably probably fits in uh, just as well, in, in my opinion. In which case, we would almost inevitably be dealing with the product of a post-singularity transhuman society who has finally become capable of traversing the boundaries between space and time. And, and can interact with past or possibly future epochs. You know, a question we might ask, we hear about ancient aliens all the time. You know, what if aliens visiting Earth had been an ancient alien civilization that existed millions of years ago, but that they had reached a point of technological proficiency on their planet or in their planetary system that they harnessed the power of the atom, and then beyond that, maybe the power of the star nearest them, and then beyond that, perhaps they created artificial intelligence and they self-improved themselves technologically they mastered gravity they mastered dimensional travel they are capable of time travel they visit not only the past but they head into the future they come they see us we're dealing with ancient aliens who are visiting us right now in that okay. hypothetical thought game but you know again all these questions should be asked yeah and it really fundamentally does to me come down to the question about time because what we may be dealing with is what we call a phenomena in our consensus space time reality right here in front of us may be anything but that so, yeah, maybe it is a bit of an imaginary idea, but we have to ask these questions to, to help ourselves think outside the box enough to frame the narrative in all the respectful ways that we can. Yeah, yeah. Now, in your book, uh, you mentioned time. Um, you do talk about time travel. You touch on it. How does this connect? To me, time travel you know, it connects with a couple of phenomena we could address here, not just UFOs, but maybe also ghosts. Time... It's a funny thing. Time is in likelihood a construct uh, of, of human thought. And in fact, time and space probably are the same thing. And I think the best evidences of that are exactly what Einstein talked about. Uh, and what we now today sometimes refer to as time dilation seems to be evidence of the warpage of space-time. The interrelationship between that and gravity, or rather the, the effect that gravity has on all such things, seems to be integral to all this. But in the book, what I talk about specifically, there was a chapter in, in Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time that really caught my attention in which he discusses what he calls the thermodynamic arrow of time. Mm -hmm. And he's and really what, what he's talking about is it, he is he's getting into the realm of what many of the modern, what we call singularitarians, the transhumanist thinkers, are talking about. The idea that we will either create a machine that can think as intelligently as humans or that humans will improve upon their, natu their, their natural intelligence utilizing machinery or digitization of human thought in the future. And Hawking made the comparison between the way a mind functions and the way that a machine utilizes, well, essentially we, we, use, we use energy and the expenditure of energy, which of course produces heat, which is essentially the entropic force, entropy being measured as the, the expenditure of heat. Um, he, he basically makes this kind of a connection between the way a mind works and the way a, a machine works. A computer can create a lot of order in the universe. It can store memory. 
but the computer will expend a lot of energy in doing so, and the computer is never capable of storing more in, uh, knowledge or creating more uh, harmony and order in the universe than the energy that is cost in order to do that, which is in keeping with entropic forces. Entropy always wins. And according to Hawking, that means that there is a thermodynamic arrow of time. We remember the past, again, likening our minds to a computer, because our brains are oriented in our space-time reality in such a way that we remember in the same direction, so to speak, in which entropy increases. And we could read a book and we could memorize every word in that book, but the time that it would take to put into that, the energy that it would cost, the meals, the number of meals that would have to be consumed to sustain life in an individual for the length of time it would take to read that book to create the order within their mind is far outweighed by the entropy, the, the, the expense of energy. But at some point, and this is where things kind of interestingly get into the, the realm of zero point and free energy and all this kind of stuff, yeah. if we were to get around entropy, not only would we be capable of probably creating free energy, but also the negentropy. I think that that term was first used by Schrodinger. That applied to human minds in the future might also allow differences in the way that we perceive space-time. If entropy is preventing us, for instance, for, from remembering the future right now, if we ever actually master negentropy, the, the negation of the entropic forces that cause the mind to function the way it does, we may easily remember the future like a psychic would say they could right now. Mm. Furthermore, we apply that to technologies. We apply that to we don't have time travel. We can't go back in time, but we can remember the past, and that seems to be a step in the right direction. Will we eventually harness technologies that will be capable of literally lessening the boundaries between what we perceive as the present and what we perceive as the past or even the future? And that idea that some physicists and philosophers alike posit that we exist in a block universe where time doesn't exist and that past, present, and future are all really one static entity, but that we are perceiving it in a linear way because this is how the human mind functions and has evolved to function, we may, yes. with the utilization of technology, be able to step beyond that one day. So that's how I think time travel actually fits into all this. Right. Now, um, just out of curiosity, what are your views on alien abduction, super soldiers, and me labs? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I've met a lot of people who have, over the years, claimed that they've been a part of uh, secret programs, what we might call me labs or military, you know, laboratories, that uh, that many associate with the broader alien abduction narrative. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I don't know. Actually, I think that there, yeah, there might be some evidence for this sort of a thing. Um, the idea that there are secret programs that are going on behind the scenes that are seeking to essentially create transhumans right now, there are ethical questions about this. You know, for instance, we had Dolly the sheep a few years ago. You guys remember? Yeah. Uh, and and there has been the question about, well, we, if we can clone a sheep, can we clone a human? Is mm. it ethical to clone a human being? You know, we, we take a heartbreaking instance, the likes of which where a family uh, has a newborn child who uh, is suddenly stricken with an illness. And if, if there's the fear that that newborn child may not make it, uh, is it ethical to consider cloning the individual? You know, it's not really, in truth, that life being saved, I guess, you know, and there, that's a difficult discussion to have because it has so many ethical considerations. So right now, according to our current, uh, you know, feelings about this, generally in the international community, we don't condone the idea of of playing God in the sense, cloning individuals and, and creating human beings in, in strange and freakish ways. But, but there have long been these... Uh, allegations, I think, that, that these kinds of things might be happening behind the scenes nonetheless. And I was approached by a television production company a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, and we had numerous talks because they wanted me to appear as a transhumanist expert, an expert in technology and transhumanism yeah. uh, on this program. They wanted me to address the idea whether I thought that there were secret facilities that were creating human-animal hybrids and all kinds of other things. And uh, I said, look, I, I couldn't tell you that that's happening, but I could tell you that if the technology exists and people can do it, they will do it. History has shown that. And so in likelihood, if it could be done, it would be done. And there is at least that possibility that it is being done. But that, in, in relation to UFOs, some have, you know, again, Whitley Strieber has even brought this up. He believes that there's a military component. He, uh, and when I brought this up to him, he said, no, 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 Micah. I'm saying I've had men in army suits enter my bedroom at night and speak to me in English. A lot of people have said that they've had this experience and that it's not an alien component, but that they have an actual intrusion by human beings 
who are part of something, some sort of a behind the scenes operation where human beings are tested and things are done to them. I haven't seen any absolute proof of this, but this is certainly a belief held among many who, again, you know, try and argue with someone like uh, Whitley who has said that this has happened to him. Um, and I can't say that it hasn't. I couldn't, I couldn't sit and say to somebody, you know, you didn't have that experience. Many people do. Who are we to say that someone hasn't had that experience? Mm. Just because there is an overt evidence for it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And so I have at very least entertained that possibility of what we call in the broader sense the, the my lab or me lab idea and the, the possibility that some of what we perceive again as being the, the UFO phenomena and the abduction phenomena could be related to that. It would seem more likely, in fact, in my mind, maybe than outright full-on physical alien contact. Right, okay. Now, um, there's a lot of talk about in the past and probably still going on now of where we go um, after we expire our life. Um, ha have you ever wondered what's under, actually under our skin? Um, you know, have you ever thought about where we come from in that respect? Some people think we are aliens. What's your theory? Uh, what's under you know, our I'll skin, Micah? <laughs> the the uh gosh you know I, in terms of there being a theory i mean you know i guess i wish i could tell you i have a theory the uh the science behind this seems to suggest that there's a likelihood that uh the the building blocks of life may not have been present on ancient earth hmm. but that in order for them to have arrived here that actually a meteoritic impact, probably a meteor carrying these building blocks of life, various mm -hmm. proteins and the like, may have traveled here to this earth from someplace else. And uh, and so in that sense of things, it very well may be that we do indeed, in, I, and this is, <laughs> I think, in the very most sincere sense of the term, we have alien origins. In likelihood, humans probably do in some way or another. And those things that led to the most fundamental first building blocks, the amino acids swarming in primordial, uh, primordial pools that literally come together and form simple life forms that go on to begin to, 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 to become cellular and then be, you know from, from becoming cellular life form to becoming multicellular life forms and still existing in the water but eventually crawling out of that ooze and coming on land for whatever reason. We can assume reasons why a mud skipper might have come on land. He was a fish when he started. And he was a frog by the time he got there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we've, we've touched on your book, The U UFO Singularity, um, uh, which was actually a 2012 release. What mm -hmm. have you done since then, or are you in the process of writing a book? Well, I've been at the beach, honestly, and I've just been <laughs> taking, in some, taking in some sun. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, we all should. I think that, you know, pleasure, harmony, and happiness are important, too. Mm. And uh, and I think that uh, that's that's an important thing. Although I, I in truth I, I I cannot tell you I've really taken an honest to god vacation since that book came out. <laughs> but but I've done a lot of traveling, and I guess that's the closest approximation, you know. And I I tend to be a busy person anyway. And that said, I am working on some books. As a matter of fact, actually there was one more book that came out uh, after the UFO Singularity in 2013. There was a book titled The Ghost Rockets, which came out, and um, that looks at uh, what are apparently a, a variety of drone technology that I think exist and, uh, and uh, are often reported as UFOs. There was a case that was reported, two cases, two incidents dating back to 2013 that are being investigated by Paul Dean and Keith Basterfield, a brilliant couple of Australian UFO researchers right now who have said, it looks like somebody's launching rockets at aircraft down here in Australia, and this is a real problem. And I don't know if they know that I've written a book that's all about that phenomenon and that looks at you know, literally the entire world uh, in terms of uh, the number of instances where that's happened, beginning in I think the summer of 1946 over Sweden and other parts of Scandinavia, which what was you know traditionally called ghost rockets, and leading up to the present day with the aviation safety reporting system, uh, which is maintained by NASA here in the United States, but it uh, catalogs and uh, utilizing an uh, anonymous uh, uh, interface to protect against litigation and and things like this. Uh, it, it documents an awful lot, I mean an awful lot of strange things, and among them I found maybe a dozen reports or so that involve what pilots claim to look like missiles or torpedoes flying dangerously close to their aircraft. So that's one book uh, that uh, that I've done since the UFO Singularity, and there are a number of others that I'll be hoping to uh, to put out, hopefully by this year, as well as a nice trip over to the Emerald Isle in June, where I'll be joining Scotty Roberts, John Ward, 
my friend Barry Fitzgerald, who sent me an email in the middle of the night about Ben Bulban Mountain, and of course James Swagger. And uh, we're going to be taking a trip of, uh, across Ireland to different megalithic sites in June, so that, that's something really to look forward to, I think, too. You must be psychic, because Beth asked me to ask you about that. Uh -huh, yes, I am psychic, Beth. <laughs> okay, uh, Andy's just asked, is, um, were you referring to the video footage showing apparent rockets fired at a UFO which appeared to be launched from Australia? I'm assuming you was on about, which one about that one, Andy? Yeah, so I was trying to get a word and it's like, whoa. Go but on. yes, that <laughs> I saw some years ago that apparently the rockets appeared to be being launched from site in Australia. I don't know if um, Mike has ever seen that video footage at all. That's interesting. I, I don't recall having seen footage, uh, but I presume this may be the same case that uh, Basterfield and Dean were talking about, or at very least one. Yeah. It, you know, it is? Okay. Okay. Now, Mike, um, tonight's show was pri primarily to um, obviously get an introductory to yourself, to some of our viewers, um, and um, also find out a bit more about you. And um, I hope that we've done that. And uh, also, um, maybe we could get you on the show again and talk about something else in the, in the future, whatever you have coming up, um, you know, and maybe how, how your uh, um, how your tour went in Ireland or something. But, uh, oh, wait. It'd be Anytime. great to have you back on the show. Well, absolutely. I would absolutely love to do that. Anytime, if I'm ever going to be in the UK and I can give you advance notice, I'll let you know. I've got a lot of friends, including Beth over there, and um, and a lot of them. Lee is another who, uh, you know, they, they've said, if you're over here, mate, let's catch up. Uh, let's have a pint and uh, let's sit down. And so I've got so many friends, really. If I were to go and visit every one of them, I'd have to spend a few years in the UK. <laughs> who knows? Maybe I'll just do that. <laughs> you never know. So what's your uh, website? The website to find me, there are two. Uh, there's my primary site, which is the Graylian Report. It's G-R-A-L-I-E-N report.com. Beth is a regular listener, of course, and uh, she would tell you just like I'm going to that everybody needs to listen to that show because, you know, all the kind of things we've been talking about here, we talk about on that show. This past week we did ghosts. We did a good old-fashioned, we turned out all the lights in the studio here, and we lit candles, and my two co-hosts, Caleb and Chris and I, we told ghost stories, and we went all the way back to the days of antiquity to do that. So that's the podcast. We don't just talk about ghosts. I mean, we talk about a lot of science, skepticism. We talk about UFOs, cryptozoology. We talk about anything, really. Anything and everything's on the table, and it's a good time. My other website is micahanks.com. Pretty simple to remember my name, and it's got articles and other news and things like that. But, but if people like the shows and the podcasts, again, I'd mentioned earlier there was the Middle Theory show. MiddleTheory.com is the site for that, and you can download all the podcasts that I produce on iTunes. Okay. And uh, and uh, Dave Lloyd's just put, um, put up there, if you uh, YouTube UFO Disarm Rockets, you'll find that footage. Um oh. And where can we get your books if we need to? Those are both available, actually. Um, or I'm sorry, those books are bo available at both of my websites, I should uh -huh. say. Okay. And you can find them on Amazon.com, too. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's been a pleasure having you on. Absolutely. And, uh, as I say, don't be a stranger. <laughs> <laughs> it would be my delight to come back anytime. Steve, Andy, uh, Suzanne, all of you guys, thank you for having me on. Good to be here with you, and I'll be happy to support you guys however I can. Okay. Keep up the good work, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Right. Talk to you soon. Bye. bye so that's about it for tonight, guys. So until next time, um, please join us. So until next time, it's good night from me. And it's good night from her. And it's good night from them. <laughs> <laughs> so all that's left to say is remember to keep, keep the, the paranormal, paranormal friendly. friendly. Good night and God bless. Good night, everyone. Bye, guys. This is where it's at. Hello. Harry Price here. Good evening. If there's nothing myself and everybody else enjoy here on the other side more is the sit back and relax and listen to Parasearch Radio with its paranormal news, views and reviews from across the UK and beyond. Make sure to find out more about them on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web, whatever they are, to keep up to date with all their broadcasts throughout the week. And I hope you enjoy them as much as we do over here. Hello? Is anybody there?